for the record, as you can see, there are a few of us here in, in the room this morning. Um, our chair, Representative Ann Pugh, our vice chair, Representative Teresa Wood, our ranking member, Representative Francis McFawn, and me, Representative Brumstead. We are all here because we care so much about this important legislation. Everyone on the House Human Services Committee has worked hard to bring forward H-171, an act relating to the governance and financing of Vermont's child care system. As you know, these past couple of days have been a bit frenetic as we work to understand the American Rescue Plan and its impact on H-171. With help from Kimberly, we, we each member of the human and all of the Human Services Committee have amended the bill. As we hear often in this virtual building, it has been a true team sport. Representative McFawn earlier today said this is the essence of our democracy, our ability to compromise. Hence, we are all here to answer, to help answer questions about this important work so that we can together bring forward the best legislation possible. And just quickly, I wanted to start by thanking all of you on the Appropri Appropriations Committee for, for all of your work over the past few years, like so many of us who have worked to improve our child care system. I'm sure many of you remember back in March of 2019 when our committee worked to meld together six different child care bills from many of our colleagues to come up with one, H-531, a very similar bill to H-171 that passed the full house 133 to zero. And, and the Appropriations Committee was right there with us to support this important work. And we are hoping today you will be with us again as we look to the next step in child care reform. H-171, a bill that was co-sponsored by 95 members, hence seems to carry the same overwhelming support from Republicans, Democrats, progressives, and independents, a priority for the House and Senate, as well as our governor. The bill continues implementation of the five-year redesign we started two years ago and is a real support for working families. In its expansion of the Child Family Assistance Program, we are assuring that no family that earns less than 150% of the federal poverty level, poverty rate, will have to pay any co-payment. Reach up families, for example, that are trying to get back to work to lift their family out of poverty are presently paying a copay of $25 per child per week. This makes it close to impossible for them to figure out how to work and, and take care of their children. This bill expands those or will allow um, those folks to not pay any copay and will expand those that qualify for some subsidy to a family earning up to 350% of the federal poverty level and, and possibly even look at going all the way to 400%. As you know, solving the child care crisis is inextricably linked to creating a thriving economy with the workforce necessary to support growing businesses. And that begins with a skilled child care workforce. That hey, been, Bradley, this is Representative Bob Helm. How that is paid enough with the necessary benefits so that they too can have families that thrive in Vermont. 90% of this workforce is female. Nationwide, early childhood educators are the lowest paid graduates of any college degree program. And in Vermont, the median annual wage for a preschool teacher trained is about $18 an hour, often without benefits. Comparatively, the median annual wage for a kindergarten teacher is $30 an hour plus benefits. That's more than a $20,000 difference in wages, not including the value of the benefits. I believe both of our committees agree that the policy embedded in this bill makes lots of sense. Loan repayment and scholarship funds for both current and prospective early childhood providers will go a long way in helping the workforce make ends meet. You will also find in this bill a financing study that will, among other things, look into how we can have a long-term financing strategy that expands financial assistance to more Vermont families and looks at how we can help early childhood providers receive benefits and compensation that are commensurate with their peers in other fields, such as primary education so that we won't continue to lose some of our best trained providers to the public school system. 
But before I get ahead of myself talking about the details of the bill, let me turn to Katie to walk us through each of the sections. Katie, Thank you. you. Um, is it best if I share my screen or it sounds like folks may have the document already open on a second screen? I believe that was, I know that we have been emailed the document and we generally tend to prefer not to do screen shares. So, okay. Madam Chair, can I just, um, so that people aren't confused because there are two drafts online. There is the one that was passed at the amendment that was passed out of the House Committee on Human Services when it had possession of the bill. And I believe the one they're about to review is the amendment they're proposing as uh, the members from that committee. So I just wanna make it perfectly clear for the people that are out there too, what you are reviewing. Thank you, that's very helpful. So I am looking at draft um, number 3.1 uh, dated today at 10.23 a.m. Is that correct? That is, correct. That is, that is the, um, that is the the draft, and that is the um, that is that is the amendment that the eleven members um, of House Human Services on a straw poll, since we don't have the bill, um, are presenting. Yeah, thank you. And we will have to sort how we how we manage this. Since you don't have possession, we do. We'll figure out what the it'll be um absolutely we absolutely will and we will do it um our proposal will be to do it the same way we um last year did another bill related to older vermonters okay i don't remember but we'll sort it when we get yeah. there yeah thank you so miss mcclenn if you'll take us through this please i would be happy to and and if i may um we need to understand it i, I and i i appreciate the absolute importance of this work, but um, give us, try to stay up high on the broad issues un until we get to the issues that affect money. And then we're, we need to probably go down deeper into that and understand those. Sure. Thank you. So the first section is a legislative intent section. I won't spend time here. I'll move on to section two which is the Child Care Financial Assistance Program, or CCFAP. Um, this is eligib eligibility language that's codified um, in current law, and you'll see that there are changes that are made in subdivision A2 of this section. So kind of the big picture of what's happening here, um, currently um, subsidy payments are based on um, each child, and this flips it so that it becomes a family co-payment versus um, based on each individual child. So it's kind of regardless on the size of the family. And um, you'll see, um, I'm down on lines 14 through 18, it says um, that families are found eligible using an income eligibility scale based on current federal poverty level and adjusted for family size. And that the co-payments are assigned to the whole family. That's what we just mentioned. And shall not increase if more than one eligible child is enrolled and families with an annual gross income of less than or equal to 150% of the current federal poverty guidelines would not have any family co-payment under this proposal. And it also lifts or increases the upper income limit. Um, so in this sentence uh, beginning on line 20, families with an annual gross income up to and including 350% of the current FPL adjusted for family size is eligible for the subsidy. Section three is also in codified law, um, and there's some changes made. There's a new subsection C added um, that discusses how um, payments to providers are calculated. So under this language, um, the payment schedule is established by the commissioner um, and may reimburse providers in accordance with the market rate survey. And in subdivision two, the payment schedule is to include reimbursement rate caps tiered in relation to the STARS program. And the lower limit of that rate cap is not to be less than the 50th percentile for similarly situated providers. Section three is the appropriation section for the previous two sections. So the previous two sections on CCFAP and provider payments under CCFAP. 
So in fiscal year 2022, 5.5 million approximately is appropriated from the general fund to the child development division to implement sections two and three. And there's also legislative intent language in subsection B. So this language um, says that in um, the intent of the General Assembly that in subdivision B1, consideration be made in fiscal years 2023 through 2026 to progressively adjust the upper income limit of CCFAP program fee scale each year. So continue the, the proposal this year was to increase it to 350. So to progressively adjust and increase that upper income limit. And secondly, it's the intent of the General Assembly that by October 1st of this coming year, the co-payment at the upper limit of the income eligibility scale for families participating in CCFAP is not to exceed 10% of the family's gross income. The next piece is section five. This is the um, building bright future. Let, let oh, me perhaps. ask you to pause there. Um, sure. I should have. It may be as section by section, if we see questions, we can sure. take them. So, Representative Harrison. Yeah, thank you, Katie. I just want to understand uh, section four. Um, this number, the five and a half million, uh, does that, was that calculated um, using that 10% uh, for a, a maximum for anybody up to 350% of the federal poverty, poverty level? I believe this is all in line with the governor's proposal this year. And I'll look to my chair and vice chair of human services to confirm that. But I believe the 350% of FBL was part of the, the governor's package that was proposed. And that 5.5 covers that. Yes, yes, that is true. Let's have counsel is correct. Okay, and, and secondly, um, when we say consideration, are we talking about raising the 350% or, or raising the dollar um, value of the 350% as um, it, there's just some inflationary pressures? Um, it, to me, the way it reads is that we're adjusting the upper income limit, the 350% to be a higher, a higher number. Okay, thank you. Our other questions <laughs> went away. Okay. Uh, Representative Squirrel? Yeah, just a small issue. Uh, page three, line 10. At the end, you have shall and may. I think it's got to be one or the other. Oh, goodness. Oh, you are, uh, uh, yes, you are right. That's a typo on my part. Thank you very much. So the, the version that the committee agreed to was the May. Um, May reimburse. So I will fix that as soon uh, uh, as we're done here. Uh, and if I may reinforce, um, this was a compromise on the part of the, um, this was a this morning compromise on the part of House Human Services in recognition that this was um, something that the administration had had some um, uh, being told what to do in future years. We had heard both from um, members of the Appropriations Committee as well as the administration that um, they didn't want a shell. Okay. And May I, uh, will, you, will you please give me the reference to where this is? Yes, we're on page three, section three, and in subdivision C1, line 10, I have a typo, says that the commissioner shall may. So the version that the committee agreed to this morning was may, and I will need to strike out the word shall. Got it. I, I actually am looking at an earlier version, so I don't have your typo. <laughs> okay. I hadn't made it yet. Yeah, okay. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. um, Representative Feltus. Yes, thank you. Just as a point of reference, can you tell me what the 350% of poverty level is for either a single individual or family of four? How, how is that calculated? 
I cannot give you that. I wonder, I see that Nolan's on. Maybe I'll see if he's available to answer that. Apologies, what was the question again? Peter. What is um, the- Can you give me a point of- What's that? A point of reference, what is 350% of poverty level in dollar amounts? So for wife, well, okay, so for 300, is 38,600, 400 is 51,520. So I can get you the exact 350 in a second. What I can do even better is I'll send a chart to the committee. We used to keep that chart taped to our desks. So I will resend the chart. Right. I'll add 350 then send the chart out. Yeah. Thank you. Okay, thank you. I think we're ready to continue, Ms. McClin. Sure. So we are up to section five, which is on page four. And this has to do with the Bright Futures Information System. So this language says that in this coming fiscal year, fiscal year 2022, 4.5 million is appropriated to the Agency of Digital Services to complete the modernization plan. In subsection B, subdivision one, by October 1st of this year, um, CDD is to make every reasonable effort to achieve full functionality of the first module of the modernization um, program. And in subdivision two, we have the creation of an end user group to provide feedback to the division on um, its rollout of the modernization program. I don't know if you want any deeper information on that. I think Should I pause? Yeah, I think we're good. You're good. Okay. So the next um, series of sections have to do with workforce supports for um, childhood providers um, or childcare providers or um, persons thinking of entering the field. So the first section, section six, um, creates language and statute. It sets up three different programs, two scholarship programs and a loan forgiveness program. In section seven, we look at appropriation language for these programs. And then in section eight, we look at a repeal. These programs, two of the three programs are time limited. So they, um, I kind of think of them together as a unit. Um, I won't go too deep into the specifics of the program, but the first of the three programs um, in section six is a scholarship for current early childhood providers. So. This is a person who is working in a regulated um, either center-based program or family child care home and who's also working to acquire credits and early childhood development. So that's the first program. The second program, um, and let me tell you where I am, page six, line nine. Um, this is scholarships for prospective early childhood providers. So this is the person who's not in the field yet, but who would like to enter the field. Um, so this is a need-based scholarship for individuals pursuing a college degree in either early childhood education or early childhood special education. And this program provides financial assistance up to the full cost of tuition. Um, there's language about um, the eligibility criteria. There's a clawback provision if somebody receives scholarship but doesn't complete their commitment to work um, in a regulated um, program for the requisite number of years after completion of their degree. Um, and then there's language, there's language in all three of these sections that um, you can't um, simultaneously participate in a scholarship program and the loan repayment assistance program. So the last of the three programs um, in statute, um, I'm on line 17 of page eight is the student loan repayment assistance program. Um, under this program, an individual, um, there's eligibility criteria. The person has to be working in a regulated program for at least an average of 30 hours a week for 48 weeks of the year. They have to receive an annual salary of not more than 50,000 and have learned, have earned an associate's or bachelor's degree um, with various major concentrations that are listed in the language. Um, and then to be eligible, the individual is to um, submit their interest in, to the department. The department issues a, a repayment award notification letter and the participant may receive up to $4,000 annually in student loan repayment assistance, which is 
distributed quarterly. Um, let's see. And then similar language about only participating in one program at a time. Okay. So that takes us to section seven, which is the appropriation and evaluation of these programs. Um, Miss McLean, yes. a bunch of hands went up. So. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Uh, Representative Harrison. Thank you. Um, Katie, maybe I was getting ahead of myself. So I'm now in section seven. Um, and my just a simple question, uh, the two and a half million here, is that one time for um, an initial program or is that an ongoing appropriation? Um, I can talk to this a little bit further, but if you see on line six, this is an appropriation for fiscal year 22. But as um, I mentioned earlier, and when we get to section eight, the repeals section, you'll notice that one of these programs is ongoing and the other two are set to um, be repealed July 1, 2026. So that would suggest that these programs would need to be funded beyond fiscal year 2022. Okay, so it's basically for now, for the next four or five years, it's on, an ongoing expense. Correct. Okay, thank you. Okay. Uh, Representative Fagan. Thank you. So, um, Katie, if you look back on um, page six of 19, line one, it says the division. What division? And then there are other references to the department and what department? In other words, uh, I'm asking here, should this be more clear or is there reference somewhere else to the division that's going to be doing the, the contracting for the administration and the department that's going to be overall responsible for it? Um, so this is set up in um, statute in Title 33, and there's already a definition section that I believe already defines department and as DCF and division as CDD. And okay. I can confirm that um, once I have a moment just to flip back into the statutes. When you do confirm, if it's anything different than that, please let me know. If not, I'm good. Thank you. Okay. Okay, thanks. And Representative Shai. Thank you. Um, Katie, I'm going back to page eight. Um, and your line 15, a participant may receive up to $4,000 annually. Um, is there a cap and annually for how long? Mm -hmm. This I, a participant under this could um, participate in, in multiple years and each year receive 4,000, um, up to 4,000. Um, how long? I think the fact that this program is set to repeal in July 1, 2026, um, you know, would indicate that at, at some point these funds wouldn't be, this program wouldn't be available anymore. But in this language itself, it doesn't limit somebody to participating to say one year or two years. Could it be four years? Uh, there isn't a limitation. Um, so I'm just trying to calculate years. So if this is fiscal year 22 and we have it expire um, July 1, 26, I think it could be four years. Yeah, and if it was extended beyond 26, it could be longer. So that's why I'm just wondering if there was a discussion maybe you know, on, on capping it for uh, individuals or a time frame for that, but it doesn't sound like there was. Um, Chair Pugh, was that was there a discussion about capping this, or? Uh, <clears throat> I am going to say that the um, discussion related to the year that it repeals, and how long um, is is that, and I will look to. Uh, Representative um, Wood and Representative Brumstead to correct me if I am wrong. That, that's, this is uh, Representative Wood, that's correct, Madam Chair, and it also um, requires the department to adopt policies and procedures related to the program. Okay. So your assumption, I think, therefore, would be that they would put some sort of management mechanism in place um, do you think they need authority to say, I mean, um, you, you're limited on how much of a grant you can receive? 
I mean, um, I, we, we, what we're thinking about <laughs> is particularly if this is not CAF, that one could receive this um, uh, loan um, indefinitely. And at some point, or, or, or would they have, the department will authorize this and when they don't off the right, so that's how it's managed. Got yes, it. yeah. and and it is on a first come first serve basis, and um, we are reliant upon the department to implement what seems to be um, logical uh, rules, uh, not rules, excuse me, guidelines with regard to how this is implemented. Yeah. Uh, um, represent, representative um, Booper, if I might just add, um, sometimes our committee likes to micromanage. Um, oh. Time we chose not to, and um, we worked with um, the department um, on this section. We have never micromanaged a single thing in the work that we do. I would no idea what you're talking about. Um, a, a question I have is, did you take testimony from the department about their capacity to administer this program and do... Are, are they able to do what we are asking them to do in these sections? They testified that they were. Interesting. One, one of the things that we've experienced, as you will recall, we've set up um, loan and scholarship programs elsewhere and statute for other things. And um, we're, we're in fact going to be fixing in the budget something that we worked on four years ago with you about, yeah. Um, so we worry about the capacity of people to do this work, but it, they, the DCF has said they can administer these three programs. They have sufficient staff to do this work. Madam Chair. Please. Um, uh, uh, the um, bill gives them flexibility to administer these programs or to contract for the administration of these programs. Um, and one of the programs um, is in existence now, uh, is one that has been in existence for some time. Um, and the other, the other two are new. So the department does currently contract out for the administration of the uh, first scholarship program. And we do give them the flexibility to um, decide whether to do this in-house or to contract out for the administration of the programs. Okay, thank you. So the scholarship programs program described in six is an existing one? Uh, yes. Okay, great. There is currently in the governor's budget $150,000 for that program. Mm -hmm. And they can administer, so, or, so this is just a continuation of the existing program. It's not an expansion. In, in uh, the, the first one under workforce, um, the, the program is current. The 150,000 is existing. Uh, and we are, as you will see in section seven, when um, legislative council gets to that, we are adding money to that program. That's what I, thank you. Um, all right, so we should let you go to section seven because that's, yeah, thank you. I do have an answer to representative Fagan's question. Um, the definition, uh, there is an applicable definition of division that would apply to these sections. There is not interestingly an applicable definition of department, but I just went through and we're okay with the first section. It doesn't, the first of the three programs doesn't use department. The third of the three programs indicates that we're talking about DCF the first time um, department is used. So I think that piece is okay. Um, where I might suggest a change would be on page seven, line one. Um, that's the second of the three programs. And that first time that department is used there, um, just adding um, for children and families after department. And then we could reference um, the department after that without worrying about which department we're referring to. Thank you. Thank you, Katie. Um, okay, so on to section seven. That is on the middle of page nine is where we start. Um, so what this 
language does, um, I guess I should just pause and recognize that there's a, in section 10, which we haven't looked at yet, we're creating, um, there's the creation of a working group, a child care working group that would look at the funding that's coming through um, from the American Rescue Plan Act and how that money should be used. So what this language does is it says that by December 15th of this coming year, the commissioner of finance is to present a recommendation to human services and health and welfare consistent with the plan of the working group um, pursuant to section 10 as to whether the source of funding for um, these three workforce programs are to come from the general fund or um, the monies provided through the um, Federal American Rescue Plan Act. And then upon approval of the commissioner's recommendation by both of the committees, the commissioner would submit a written certification to the Joint Fiscal Committee as to the commissioner's recommendation and the requisite approval by both committees. And once that written certification is submitted to JFC, the appropriation um, that we've looked at already in subsection B um, would be able to take effect. And then in subsection B, we have the appropriation itself in fiscal year um, and the amount, the breakdown by the three different programs. Okay. Why don't I ask you to pause there for a second? Sure. Um, see if there are questions. And I, uh, Representative Jessup. Right. So I just want to just make sure we put on the record this is an or on line 17 on page nine. So depending how things unfold with the rest of the bill we'll get to, um, the intention here is that if the parameters fit with the American Rescue Plan, that's how it's currently constructed with an or, and I just wanna make sure that's flagged. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you. And then in, in sub B, in fiscal year 22, it appropriates, it proposes an appropriation of 300,000. The current year appropriation is 150. Am I correct on that one? Okay. Um, and so can you talk to us about wh why it would be doubled? Uh, and. I think that's a committee member who might have some. Involved. Okay, I was just I was looking at my chair and I was trying to decide if she was going to respond or I, I can respond. Uh, uh, we received uh, testimony from the current programs that there's actually a backlog of individuals who um, uh, are awaiting um, the ability to participate um, in this particular program. Um, the other two programs are new. Um, but this program, um, they already have individuals who are waiting to participate in this, um, mm -hmm. probably, frankly, probably more than what the appropriation is putting forth here. Okay. How many people are covered by the 150,000 in the existing appropriation? Uh, I can get back to you with that information. I don't have it off the top of my head. Thank you. And I guess we would similarly be interested in how many people could be served by the new appropriations and perhaps a sense of how that fits in the universe of what the need is. Thank you. Yeah. Thank um, you. We will get back to you, um, Representative uh, Hooper. Um, remember um, the, the, um, the department will have some flexibility on how they structure this program. Mm -hmm. As to the amounts that can be awarded and how it's, how it's managed, yeah. So they could theoretically offer less and, and spread it out over more people. There's not, a, is there a minimum amount that is offered under each? Per participant, it's it's capped at a max, right? Right. Yeah. It is, right. It is it is capped at oh. at a max, and I think for for and I appreciate your comments. For us, the um, when you say how many, I'll go back to what Representative yeah. Wood said. There is a backlog 
there are people who want to do this work who cannot. Um, and we all know that um, the lack of, that there are, that we need more quality, affordable childcare. And one reason we don't have it is we don't have people who are um, either keeping the jobs, being able to stay in their jobs or enter the, the jobs. Yes, at, at, and I would just add to Madam uh, Chair Pugh's um, comment that uh, as Representative Brumstead pointed out in her opening comments, the wages that these people are currently earning prohibits them from seeking any kind of higher education um, because of those wages. And so um, they're, they're not able to further themselves in this field. And uh, as I don't need to, um, comment on the, the status of this workforce, uh, like many other workforces, is uh, significantly lower than what we need. Yeah. Please do not infer from my asking questions of lack of support or criticism. I'm just trying to understand um, what is being accomplished as well as what the need is. Not, not uh, these are not judgmental questions. Um, so thank you. Uh, I'm not seeing any additional questions from the committee, so I think we can move to the next section. Okay. Um, so section, we were still in section seven. Um, there's a subdivision C. This is just a report back before the programs are set to um, be repealed, um, assessing the effectiveness of the programs and then um, asking whether they should be repealed in accordance with the next section of the act, or if they should be retained and funded in their current state or retained, but amended in some way. Next um, is section eight, and this is the repeals language. Um, this language has been a little tricky to understand um, because only the latter two programs are being repealed, the um, subsection B and C the scholarship for prospective early childhood providers and student loan repayment assistance. If you look at A, we're just repealing um, subsection D, not the whole program, which is the reference to the other two programs since they're going away. Okay, thank you. The next section um, has to do with the powers and duties of the Building Bright Futures um, organization. They currently have a list of powers and duties in statute. This um, just adds to it. Um, this adds um, responsibility of giving advice um, to the administration general assembly on planning related to the administration and operation of Vermont's child care system. Um, it also, um, there's existing language on develop uh, an early care health and education system plan and the language added was which shall reflect the growing diversity of Vermont's children and families. And um, in subsection, subdivision 12, um, there is a current duty that has to do with convening members of the child care community, medical community, education community, et cetera. And the committee added business community to this list. The next section is section 10. This is what I referenced earlier about a working group to look at um, money's um, coming from the American Rescue Plan Act. Ms. McClendon, so, I just ask you to pause before we move there. Sure. Um, I certainly am not, and I am guessing that other members of the Appropriations Committee are, are not familiar with building um, bright futures and it's, um, it, and I see that it is a statutorily constructed group. I, I am kind of curious about, is it part of state government? Is it, can you kind of, can someone please describe it's what it is um, in its relationship to state government? It's set up as a public private partnership um, and it is a, um, responsible for convening and providing research and information um, on the child care and early education systems. I think it's broader than that. Um, I, I don't have much more to add without pulling up the statutes, but I'm sure mm -hmm. the committee members could elaborate a bit on that. Um, um, if I may, um, Representative Brumstead um, has been our liaison 
um, too, and if she can respond to that. Sure. So um, Katie did a wonderful job, actually, uh, letting you know the beginnings anyway, that um, BBF has been named to undertake um, various analysis and evaluate and make recommendations to um, the House and Senate um, regarding early care and education governance and overall early care. So from nutrition to child care. Um, and they do, they go out, they have um, groups all over the state made up of um, people who are impacted by the programs and they do focus groups and all kinds of research. The um, Morgan Coleman, who I think has been in to talk with your committee, um, is the executive director of that program. And there is a state advisory council where there are four legislators who sit on it. And I'm actually one of the legislators. The other three spots right now are vacant. Um, but generally, they're, they're our arm to come to us. They do all this research and then they come to us each year, um, usually uh, inviting us to a big event in September where they lay out what they've learned and the policy um, recommendations. But they are both public-private, a partnership that we created uh, back after the blue, before the Blue Ribbon Commission actually. And that yeah. was the first big project. Um, and if I might um, add or summarize to what uh, Representative Brumstead um, outlined um, very nicely, it's it's our state advisory council um, for early childhood. Um, it's the primary um, advisor to the governor and the legislature around um, um, early childhood, um, and we have uh, we while well, we all of us received um, a very full document earlier this uh, session that, that in this particular um, time focused um, on uh, mental health. Um, and so this is um, Morgan Crossman, who is the uh, executive um, director. Okay, thank if, if you. If that I answers that. Um, and yeah. if, I, um, if I might in um, the ability of people um, who know I need lots of help um, your question about numbers um, um, in terms of the uh, scholarship, 450,000 um, um, in terms of how, how it is being run this year, the, the program um, would, uh, would fund 50 associate degrees, 20 licensures and 25 bachelor's degrees. So that kind of, that's kind of the breakdown. Thank you, will you say that again? Uh, <clears throat> This is, this is what we um, got from uh, Sonia, whose name escapes me now. In fact, I can pull out her first name is um, amazing. 450,000 um, fund 50, associ 50 associate degrees, 20 licensures, people towards licensure and 25 bachelor's degrees. Sonia Raymond, sorry. Thank you. This is, this is, this is why we're all here. Yep. It's the way we work too. So 50 um, and the um, and the 150 proposed by the administration would fund a, a small portion of it. They would fund some licensure and associates, and um, it would be a um, it's be a we'd have to um, maintain, um, which is why we've gone up. We have to maintain a uh, waiting list, and so that's some of the numbers. Okay, thank you. Which is why we went up. Because there's a, yeah. So 50 associates degrees, 20 licensures, and what was the 25? Um, um, uh, the, the 25 was um, uh, BAs, I believe. Now, now I have to go back to my um, phone a friend. Yes, Madam Chair, the 25 was bachelor's degrees. And you said four hundred and fifty dollars, a uh, four hundred and fifty thousand, I think. Yep. Um, I'm. That's what we're doing with the current money. Yes. I thought the current and the current money is what one hundred and fifty. I'm now. What is the current money? 
the current money is 150 and this bill seeks to add 300. So um, oh. the figures that Rep Pugh just gave you would be for the full 450 next that's what I was year. After. So that's what 450 buys us. Got it. Thank yes. you. Yes. Got it. Thank you. Very helpful. Isn't it nice to have electronic devices so you get answers quickly? Saves running around. Um, I, I stopped us on section nine and I think we were going to section 10. Thank you. So uh, section 10, um, again, is just, um, it's, the, it's the working group that's being created to look at the use, the appropriate use of funds that are coming to the state through the American Rescue Plan Act. So the first subsection sets out the purpose of this group and the membership. Building Bright Futures in coordination with the Department for Children and Families is to convene the group composed of mutually agreed to stakeholders that reflect growing diversity of Vermont's children and families, including individuals who are black, indigenous and persons of color. Members in the working group uh, shall include a representative from both the House um, Committee on Human Services, Senate Committee on Health and Welfare, as well as individuals representing families, child care and after school providers, the business community, child welfare advocates, and consultation with any other individuals necessary <clears throat> to develop uh, um, and recommend a plan for the most effective use of the federal funds um, coming through the new act and to meet the immediate and future child care needs of Vermonters. And then in subsection B, we go into the responsibilities of the group. The group is to produce a plan that makes a recommendation to the General Assembly regarding the use of funds in conjunction with other state and federal resources to maximize the amount of funding available. And the plan is to ensure that Vermont's allocation um, of the Child Care Development Block Grant and the Child Care Subsidy um, Stabilization Grant are fully utilized. The plan is to specifically address the following priorities but the working group group need not be limited to consideration of the listed priorities below. So they have to look at these items, but they can also be more expansive. Those items include um, funding, necess uh, funding necessary to ensure that the co-payment for a family participating in CCFAP is, uh, shall not exceed 10% of the family's annual gross income, expansion of CCFAP to families up to 400% of the current federal poverty level, funding necessary to complete the uh, systems analysis and financing studies that we'll look at shortly, funding necessary to implement the workforce programs that we've uh, just recently looked at, increased access to high quality infant care, access to high quality affordable childcare for culturally and racially diverse families, support and assistance to stabilize regulated, privately operated center-based programs and family child care homes, and the identification of any statutory or regulatory barriers to using the federal funds to address the immediate and future child care needs of Vermonters. Should I pause there or keep going? Um, well, we do have a hand, so thank you for the pause. Rep Shai. Yes, thank you. Um, in that section, and then I am just jumping ahead to line two of the next page, but in that section, uh, there's a, sort of a general description of a mutually agreed upon group of people, but I don't think I saw a number for this council. Was, is there a number that's associated with it and will there be per diems at some point for that? That's, we may not have per diems. that's correct. There wasn't a number and then there's language that we're getting to that talks, um, well, let me scroll down. Um, I'm looking at um, subsection F at the bottom of this section, that members of the working group shall be entitled to either per diem compensation or reimbursement or of expenses or both as mutually agreed to by Building Bright Futures and the department. Uh, if, if I may, and I may, um, uh, if I may, Madam Chair. Please. Um, this is modeled, um, this section it, with consultation from Representative Jessup was modeled after um, what is a, a process by which um, the, um, the necessary people are put in a room to figure out 
how to spend um, the federal money and um, uh, resisting all of our desire to identify um, and to tell Building Bright Futures and the administration who exactly has to be yeah. at the table um, um, on a process that needs to happen quickly and expeditiously. Um, mm -hmm. We did not put a limit, um, nor did we put a minimum. There, the people who know how to who know how to make the decisions, who know what the money means, um, are going to figure out. And we've outlined some um, a few guard posts or a few suggestions. Mm -hmm. Okay. And I can appreciate that and the need to be um, expeditious and get the right people in the room. That makes sense. And I am jumping ahead to page 15, line two. The first report is due in a month, April 20th, 2021. Mm -hmm. Is that realistic? Um, um, as I said, this was based on um, working with Representative Jessup and based on a, um, we may know something. And so it gets put in the, um, we may know something more, so then it will be put in the budget or something else. And now I'm going to um, phone a friend. Okay. It's Representative <laughs> Jessup. <laughs> so um, thank you, Chair Pews. So, and Robin, that's a great question. So what I was after, there is some other um, language I've been working on with the housing group, which is... Um, trying to realize that if these federal funds are coming and the legislature is going to adjourn in May and this bill goes over to the Senate when there will still be a chance to work on it, what might the guidance be for use of federal funds? So that's kind of what I was aiming for. Now, the exact, um, you know, the number of people and so on, um, I'm not gonna comment on that, but um, that, that was the, as Chair Pugh has said, the goal there. What uh, the Appropriations Committee has not seen yet is a similar structure that um, Representative Jessup and I have talked with members of the Agency of Housing of Human Services uh, around the general assistance program in, in with the GA program or the emergency housing program in the GA and what we are experiencing with emergency housing as we are here in the childcare world is this vast unknown that is created and potentially wonderful opportunity created by the ARPA. And we're trying to put in place an opportunity to do some smart thinking around um, the, the new money that is there the very thoughtful, carefully crafted um, work of the original child care bill had built um, a series of studies and analysis um, that was essentially based on, and forgive me for, a, a, I, I hope, a lay person's not understanding, but it was based on kind of what was the past world, the pre-pandemic world, and we're trying to figure out how to take advantage of what will be. And that thus the reason for this quick turnaround, trying to gather the right people together, et cetera. And, and that, that's what's being striven for here. And so with that, I so we always ask how many meetings and how many people, and that's the reason Rep. Shai appropriately asked, and we'll have to have a conversation about the uh, reimbursement piece of this. We'll, but let's take that offline. We'll, we'll sort that later. We need to keep walking through here, mm -hmm. I think. Representative um, Jessup? Just a, a quick um idea is that it may be out of this quick and nimble group that's that seeks to put a stake in the ground with how the legislative branch seeks to use this money and who should be at the table when those decisions are made. It may be that out of that same group comes different recommendations for further future mm -hmm. uh, analyses and so on. But the point here is to work within the time frame box and variables before us. So I just am simply saying there may be a bridge between those two. Ultimately, it's hard to predict. Yeah. All of this is hard to predict. <laughs> <laughs>
Um, so let's um, let's go to section. Uh, I'm sorry, Rep Pew, did you want to add something? Uh, uh, nothing. I just I was going to sleek away, but I thought I might as well do it publicly. I apologize. I have to go teach now. So um, uh, I am, <clears throat> which is one reason why I brought half the committee okay. here. Um, and so I will um, thank you all for your time. And um, the three members of the committee who remain are at your disposal. And uh, Representative Wood as vice chair, um, please will be in my stead. So thank you very much. And thank you for your work. And thank you for your time. Yeah, we are in good hands. Okay, let's go on to section 11. Okay. Um, section 11 is a uh, one-time report back from the Department for Children and Families about the costs and policy implications of moving from an attendance-based model to an enrollment-based model in the CCFAP program. Is this the same as what was in before? It is. There was another piece of this on co-payments, and now we're just, this okay. um, particular study is just looking at this issue. Thank you. Okay, dope. Not seeing any questions, so 12. Okay, 12 is a systems analysis. Um, this is also similar to what was in before. It's been um, truncated a bit, as, as has the financing piece. But um, this requires that by September 1st of 2022, Building Bright Futures is to submit an analysis and recommendations to the policy committees um, regarding different issues, the existing childcare and early childhood education systems and administrative stakeholders and structures, including functions that are not currently staffed or understaffed, emerging systems needs, stakeholder engagement and decision-making processes and state plan development, mechanisms to strengthen system oversight and leverage current system strengths, identification of existing needs and challenges, and ensuring an anti-racist approach is utilized in modifying existing policies and procedures and creating new policies and procedures. We have instructions that the findings of this um, um, group are to be divided in two categories, first birth through age five and then six through 12 years of age, and that this work is to rely on the advice of the section 10 work group that we just looked at, the group looking at the federal funding. And then we have a definition should I pause there or move on to financing? Um, no, let's, oh, I'm sorry. Um, I don't see any questions, so I think we can move on. Okay, the next section is the financing study. Um, if you had looked at the earlier version of this, the dates have all been um, pushed back. So um, the, and the earlier version had JFO contracting with a consultant this fall that date has been pushed back to January 1, 2022, that JFO is to con contract with an economist or independent consultant with specific expertise in this field um, to, <coughs> excuse me, evaluate the, the economic impacts of and potential, potential funding mechanisms to adjusting Vermont's childcare system, regulated childcare system for children from birth through age five years of age with consideration given to the intersection of the impacts on child care for children from six through 12 years of age, and also in alignment with the recommendations of the after school task force, and that the work of the economists or independent consultant um, shall be go governed by the following. First, that a family does not spend more than 10% of its gross annual income on child care. Second, that the child care providers receive compensation that is commensurate with their peers in other fields. And third, that utilization of a cost of care model versus a market rate model um, in the CCFAP program. And then um, we have a tiered um, reports coming, coming in. Um, I'm on line 13, subsection B. First, by November 15th of 2023, the consultant is submitting preliminary results to JFO and to the chairs of the very various committees, policy and um, money committees. And then uh, two months later, January 15th, 2024, the consultant is submitting to the same committees a final report. Um, the results um, include that um, project the cost of expanding the state's childcare benefit to more families in accordance with this section, 
requiring commensurate pay for providers and utilization, utilizing cost of care for CCFAP and the feasibility of implementing each policy in Vermont, both separately, independently of each other and jointly. And then identify and determine the feasibility of implementing stable long-term funding sources to finance affordable high quality childcare system for birth through age five. So I could pause there or Please. move along to effect um, date. We have a hand, Representative okay. Townsend. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, my question is with regard to the contracting of the, um, of the economist or an independent consulting entity with expertise in the field. How is that being paid for? How is that proposed to be paid for, that contracting? That's one of the items that um, the, the Section 10 working group looking at federal money is looking at to oh. um, specifically their, um, both this financing report and the previous analysis report, um, the Section 10 group is looking at um, whether <laughs> that federal source of money can be used here. Thank you. Nicely done. Uh, Representative Harrison. Yeah, thank you. Um, sometimes we unfortunately get our news through media reports and there was some concern raised about if this was all implemented, it could cost, I don't know, $200 million a year, which would obviously beg for new tax increases. And I don't know if that's accurate or not, or if I was uh, misinterpreting what I had read or heard, but um, is there anything in this study that would um, allow the report to come back with um, uh, possible options? Like let's say it's 10% here, or you know, another option might be 12% uh, or some type of sliding scale or 15% um, uh, going forward. I'm, I'm just trying to look at the political realities, uh, you know, and again, my numbers may be way off base, but I just, sometimes I know what I read and, and it may not be accurate. Uh, Representative Harrison, I, I believe that you are um, reflecting um, what, what Digger reported um, from hearing testimony in our committee. So I, I think that part's accurate. Uh, the, uh, one of the reasons that um, we are not obligating the state to do this, that we're investigating, this is an investigatory um, process in this study. Um, and there isn't anything here that precludes um, a consultant from offering other options. Good luck, sweetie. Okay, thank you. Okay, um, a question that, that I have on this section is that we're directing here that JFO will be responsible for this. Uh, did you have a conversation with them or with others about who could be doing this like DCF? Um, actually, yes, um, Madam Chair, we, we had quite a conversation about that particular subject and um, we uh, went round and about and JFO came back to us with uh, feeling like based upon their uh, previous experience, I think the most recent um, example that was given was the uh, higher ed study um, that they felt that they could facilitate this. They did not want to conduct it, but they felt that they could facilitate it uh, through a contractor. And I, I believe uh, Nolan is on if, if he wants to comment on that, but that was, um, that was uh, the information that they gave to us. Okay, thank you. Um, thank you. So I'm not seeing any other questions. Can we, um, I think we're at um, effective dates. Did, did, we just did the 13, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So the effective dates, the I guess the important things to take away is that because we have this section 10 report um, that, that is desired by April 30th, that that particular section will take effect on passage. Um, the other sections take effect on July 1, 2021, with the exception that the two um, CC fat pieces, the sections two and three, take effect on October 1st, 2021. And I believe that's to be in line with the, the federal government's calendar on um, the redesign. Mm -hmm. Okay. 
Thank you. Uh, Representative Jessup. Yeah, and just this was a question that was posed to me, and I'm sure you all have thought about it. Supposing this uh, bill isn't passed till after that date, is the assumption that um, the other body would adjust that? That date? Yeah. Yeah. Yes, Representative Jessup. And um, I'm certain that between the people who are participating in this room and the people who are listening uh, in on uh, YouTube, um, and knowing that the administration uh, and other advocates are already busily at work trying to understand the ramifications of the American Rescue Plan mm -hmm. Act. Um, uh, I, yeah, we, we may have to modify that date depending upon how things progress, but um, you know, based upon your recommendations previously with the other work group that you're looking at is why we included that date. And the, uh, in, in particular, we really um, want this opportunity for the legislature to weigh in on how this substantial amount of money, which is uh, approximately $47 million, um, will be spent. Uh, so um, that is why the quick turnaround time on these things. Right, I'm actually asking in part to help me when I have to defend the housing group. So thank you. <laughs> um, so, uh, Appropriations Committee, we have gotten to the end of this bill. Um, let's make sure that we ask um, all of our questions here. Uh, Representative Feltus. I would just like to, a summary if we can figure out the amount of appropriations in this bill. There was a five million I saw, and then there are these various scholarship funds. And is it just the five million plus three hundred thousand plus four hundred thousand plus one point eight? It's in the fiscal note. Uh, with the like. Oh, do we? I'm sorry. Do we have a fiscal note? We have yeah, a fiscal I mean, note. I apologize um, for interrupting. I was just trying to be helpful. No. So yes, I we have a fiscal note. Nolan is here, so maybe we can address that in a moment, but let us um, make sure that we finish touching on with on the bill uh, in particular in case folks need to run out to other work. Dave, are you, your hand is up. Yes, you, you, you may have just covered this, uh, Representative Wood. Um, do we have the flexibility in this language or could we add language that says um, in lieu of or instead of using general fund for the rate increases, the 5.5 million, we'll use new CFAP money? Um, the the 5.5 million is in the base budget of the uh, Department for Children and Families. It's existing funds, it's well, not additional funds. I'm sorry, I thought I read where the language said it's in the governor's FY22 recommend. Yes. He may, he's recommending the expenditure, but that doesn't mean the dollars are there. Um, it's my understanding and Representative Jessup can correct me if I'm incorrect on this. And I believe that Commissioner Gresham is also here someplace um, that the, uh, the 5.5 million is in the base budget of the Department for Children and Families. It is from um, under expended funding um, in the Child Care Financial Assistance Program, um, frankly, as a result of changing uh, workforce patterns during the pandemic. But it is, so, in, the it is in the base as far as I understand it. And uh, so are else you can are you concerned as we come out of the pandemic and the workforce participation rates change that the normal uh, increase or pressures on CFAP coupled with the increase in the benefits, 350% of poverty and the 10% limit and the no copays um, will create a problem? Um. That's a good question, Representative Iacovone. Um, I, I frankly think that um, 
none of us right now sitting here know what the workforce situation is going to look like over the next two years. Um, and right now, the access to child care is something that is critical that we address. And will there be changes in the workforce? Yes. Um, will there be changes in the number of people working from home? I think the answer to that is yes. Um, but uh, I, I can't sit here and tell you that we know all the answers to that sitting here today. Thank you. So uh, the Appropriations Committee will have a longer conversation about what funding is available, but I just want to be clear, particularly with the Human Services Committee, is yes, the governor is proposing um, the 5.529 million for CCFAP in his budget as a base spend. He also proposed to add um, Kino and sports betting as a revenue source. That revenue source was covering the cost of doing this. By our not adopting that revenue source, we do not have the revenue that was proposed to be used in this way. Secondly, I'd like to mm -hmm. note that we used one-time money to cover a hole in the CCFAP program in um, the current year. And so in fact, we are having to backfill that hole to get us up to the level that we're at. That, th th that's our job is to figure out if, if we have the revenues to support the policy initiatives of the Committee of, of Human Services, but I just, um, to say that it's in the base is a little bit misleading because we have to make sure that the revenue was there to cover what the base costs were. Ma um, Madam Chair, yeah, um, uh, that is a little bit different from the testimony that we heard from the Department for Children and Families from the department um, in our committee. Um, they identified the th uh, $3 million from uh, Kino as um, accommodating for what Representative Iacoboni um, was just speaking of, and that is if utilization increases, that that $3 million would cover that piece. But for the changes that occur uh, in the policy in this bill, um, they testified in our committee that that $5.5 million is actually currently available. So I'm just saying that's what they testified to in our committee. I, I appreciate it. I may not fully understand it. What I know is we are not raising an additional five plus million dollars. And therefore that money is not available for some spending somewhere within state government. I think we've all kind of assumed that there was a relationship between the new spending proposed, and I think the governor said that in his budget, that it was being raised, maybe not, I, I don't remember. But we do have a, an issue with where is the money to pay for that. That's our job. We'll, it's our job to sort that out, and, and, and we will. Yes, I just wanted to let you know what they had testified to. Yeah, well, that's interesting, and, and we'll kick that around a little bit. Um, if, I could, if I could just add for one second on that one, that was the area of the budget that I looked pretty closely. Mm -hmm. So I went and talked with a lot of folks in the administration and really pushed on this three million. Was it really new or was it, was it part of that five million? And they were so clear in their discussions with me, because we did work hard. We understand what you are saying, Madam Chair, and we're concerned about that. So we, we, we worked hard to figure out if, uh, if that's how they looked at it. Mm -hmm. So I appreciate that. We are not raising as much money as the governor proposed to raise. Therefore, we have less money to spend. That at, at the end of the day, that's the um, the arithmetic of, um, of of appropriations. I hear you that, that you've been assured that there is available ongoing money that is somewhat at, at odds with what I had understood to be the case. Again, we will 
that that's our job to sort out. Um, Representative Harrison. Yeah, thank you, um, Madam Chair. And I don't want to prolong this, but um, I just happened to look at Nolan's uh, chart on the uh, the various uh, income levels up to 350% of poverty. And you folks in human services are very familiar with the uh, benefit cliff issue. Um, so I'm looking at it and I just picked, you know, a family of four, 92,000. Um, their maximum spend would be 9,200. Um, child care for two kids could easily cost uh, over $30,000, but, you know, just to make it easy, uh, they could be eligible for, say, a $20,000 uh, subsidy here. Um, you get to the $95,000, um, obviously, it, it, it doesn't make sense. Don't give me that uh, pay increase uh, because it's going to cost me $20,000 of subsidy I no longer get. Um, did you look at any type of phase out? Um, I know you're working within the five and a half million, but um, you know maybe it's ten percent at three hundred percent, and then it phases out to I, I don't know. But we we we've established a benefit cliff here. Um, I I will say that we um, have not established, um, I guess I'm, I'm not sure that I uh, agree with you, Representative Harrison, um, in terms of um, that analysis. It would take us um, more time to look at what um, JFO's consultants have previously looked at in terms of how that, that slope, and I, I really refer to it as a slope now because we have done a lot of work in the legislature to reduce the cliff. It is really no longer a cliff. It is uh, there is a slope, um, and um, we have not looked at how this bill in particular um, looks at that slope, and I, I think, um, honestly, that uh, that is something that we, we should do, um, and we um, can ask JFO for their assistance with that. Um, yeah, no, uh, Thank you. And maybe Nolan has more information. I'm just asking if you looked at that because I can see, um, you know, a potential loss when you go over to the next, you just above 350%. And I know you're studying it and hopefully you get to a, another point in time, but today for the foreseeable future, um, we have, I think, established a new benefit cliff. Um, that takes away incentive to earn a little bit more and better yourself uh, potentially. And I, you can use the same money, um, not go as generous, but to cut the 10% off earlier and then phase it out. Um, so, um, Folks, I'm concerned about time. We're a half an hour over our usual time and we're back together here in an hour. Um, I, we need to take a look real quickly at the fiscal note. Um, let me just say to the Appropriations Committee, um, I don't know if you realize that what we have just walked through has been a, a labor of the Human Services Committee all session long. This has been a tremendously important bill to them. It is a tremendously important effort on behalf of Vermonters. And they sent this, actually you all got this out of committee in a rather timely fashion, unlike some of the other major policy initiatives that are just now streaming into our committee. It feels like we're feeling a little overwhelmed. Um, you, you got it to us in a very timely fashion. Un unfortunately, that gave some of us a chance to look at it and say, oh my goodness, in the new world, some of this may need to be rethought. And what I'm saying to the Appropriations Committee, they rethought this in record time and substantively changed some of the studies and the, and the work that was being done. And Rep Wood and Brumstead and McFawn, I hope you will convey 
our my appreciation to your committee for recognizing this new world and working so hard to try to 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 accommodate that and to take advantage of the wonderful opportunities that are coming down um, uh, from the federal government. I mean, it's all good work, but you you need to be complimented on that. In section seven, I see what you were doing in terms of trying to say, pay attention to the federal money that's coming in. We may have a different way of phrasing that, um, in, in, but, but we will accomplish the same thing. There's some substitution language that I think JFO has come up with for some other bills that says, use, use the federal money and if you can't, then use the state money. But that that's just how we do money. Um, I committee, I'm, I can't let you go until we just take a quick look at the um, fiscal note. I, 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 I know it's late. You've been sitting here since eight o'clock this morning and I deeply appreciate it. Um, but no one can, and so members, you received an email. I think it came from you, Nolan, or maybe from Teresa, I'm not sure, uh, I'm German. Um, but if we can just quickly take a look at the fiscal note, Nolan, I'll turn it over to you. It's online. It's online. Just refresh, Actually. refresh. And just, uh, um, and for the record, Nolan Langwell, the Joint Fiscal Office, and just so I know you don't want it on the screen, right? Yeah, yeah, we, we do not want it on screen. Okay. Um, so I'll walk through this really fast. Um, again, as Teresa mentioned, it should be online. Uh, I have draft written on it because I was doing it on the fly and there's still some typos and errors and clarifications that need to happen, but I wanted you to have something. Um, so I'll just do this really quick. So sections two, three, and four dealing with the CCC FAP, sorry, CC FAP, um, that is the 5.5 million as we just were talking about moments ago. Uh, it's funded in the governor's budget recommendation. Testimony that we had heard was that it was being funded through underutilization of CCFAP. Um, there's also um, intent language regarding consideration of the future of family out-of-pocket limits. Um, I just always flag intent language. This is, it's pretty light intent language, but I always flag it because I know committees often feel about that. Um, but it's not, uh, doesn't tie anything up. Um, section five, you have 4.5 million. Again, this is also included in the governor's budget, so I won't go into it. And then we have uh, section six, seven, and eight. I just sort of lumped them together because they're all tied. Um, and those are the scholarships that we discussed or that were discussed, the, the 300, the 400, and the 1.8. Um, and then, then there's a new section that would, um, seven, which would require the commissioner of finance to present the recommendations uh, consistent with the final plan to the work of the working group that was highlighted in section 10 as to whether the funding should be general funds or federal funds. Um, and there's a whole process where the recommendation is presented to, I, I won't walk you through this again, you already know that, but there's a process for how determining whether it's this, this particular fund should be federal or, a, or state dollars. Um, and then the total appropriation, you have 300, 400, 1.8, and the sources of the funds are to be determined. Section 10 creates the committee, this, this that would look at the ARPA is what, we're, what I'm calling it. Um, and as was discussed in this committee about per diems, you know, a lot of times per diem language has the statutory language listed. This does not have statutory lesson. Uh, it just sort of says, members would be entitled to either per diem compensation or reimbursement of expenses or both as mutually agreed to by Building Bright Futures and DCF. So it doesn't tie the statutory amounts and it leaves some flexibility. So that'll be part of the discussion as I heard the chair talking about when you figure out the number of people, the number of meetings and in that discussion will be what would be the reimbursement. What I do often say though, uh, is that when appropriations for per diems come in, you know, anywhere between three and 5,000, uh, given the size of these budgets, I often say that they can be accommodated with the existing budgets. It's only when they start getting above 5,000 or 10,000 that I really start saying, you really need to appropriate money. Um, so that's one thing that I just sort of flag. 
in this case, um, if the group is small and they don't meet much, which the, it would cease to exist on December 1st, 2021. So they may not have a lot of meetings. They might determine it relatively quickly. There might not be a lot of meetings. Um, so I suspect this would be not a big number. Um, and then we have the two studies. We have the uh, Building Bright Future studies um, and the JFO study. Both of them are tied to the Section 10 language, which is contingent. So it's there's no appropriation in the bill um, for these. The only thing I would flag is that um, even though the work really for, for in the JFO study isn't really till 2023 and 2024, it does say that we have to contract by um, January of 2022. And so the only thing I question I ask, and this is something I have to ask, talk to Steve about, do we contract with contractors when we haven't had the money appropriated yet? The flip side is, is that we often worry about that when we put the amount of money in law that we're gonna use for contractors, contractors always come in $1 below that amount. So maybe not having the money mm -hmm. make for a more competitive bid. So I'm just throwing that out there for discussion, um, but I don't think it's a big deal. Um, and then the last page uh, on the back is just the um, outline of all the money. And you, as you'll see about 10 million of it is uh, was included in the governor's budget. And then this bill is 2.5, which is basically the three, the, the two scholarships and the loan repayment of the 2.5 million for a total of 12.5. Great. Thank you for that rapid run through, literally <laughs> a run through. Uh, Kimber, uh, Representative Jessup. All right, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, while we still have two members or three members from um, Human Services, would anyone like to put on the record um, how this may or may not align with your budget memo ask for 261,000 annually for building bright futures? The advisory council. Uh, sure, thank you, uh, Representative Jessup for uh, asking the, that question. We had previously had a specific dollar amount in our, the previous version of our bill uh, for building bright futures, but we removed that. Uh, pending action by the Appropriations Committee on our budget recommendation in our budget memo. And could, could I just follow up? If, if we were to fund the um, ask that was in the policy memo, is it your view that uh, Building Bright Futures then would have the capacity to do all that is asked in H-171? Um, I believe that they would. However, they also, um, uh, in section 10, you'll see a notation that there is the opportunity for them to um, work with the department in determining um, whether any additional resources might be funded under ARPA, if there, if there was a need for that. Okay. Um, thank you all. I have been privately told that I am wrong um, with regard to the funding. I am not letting go of this. Yes, there is an underspend. There will stop being an underspend at some point and, and, therein, and that creates a gap and that's what we have to deal with. But again, that's our job and we'll sort that out, but you know. So, but, but let me acknowledge. I I understand what was what the testimony. I understand that position, and I continue to be concerned because we did not see a revenue increase, and that creates a pressure in terms of how we accomplish these goals. Um. I I. I we are now 45 minutes over our normal breaking time. Um, and we have to be back in here at 1.15 when we're going to hear actually, no, it's a healthcare bill. I was gonna, I was going to say it's another human service bill. Uh, healthcare bill. So I want to let the committee go, but however, so let me say to the human services committee again, our deep thanks for, thank you for this work and in particular your flexibility in responding to our request to rethink 
um, a, a good portion of the thoughtful work that you'd put into this bill. Uh, uh, that must have been hard and we really appreciate it. Thank you. Um, you're welcome. I did. We would also just like to thank the committee for their consideration this morning and as you deliberate and um, know that um, we are available if you need any um, further clarification of of our intent or any questions that come up. And um, we, again, deeply thank you for your time this morning. Yeah, great. Thank, thank you. you guys. And good. before we, uh, uh, Appropriations Committee, we have an, a different business matter to attend to. Human service people, you're, it's safe for you to leave. We are not going to talk about this, I promise.